Well, everyone, hello, hello. Welcome back to another Canada Immigration Live q and I'm here, Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer with my good friend and colleague, Alicia backman Bahari, also a Canadian immigration lawyer. How are you doing, Alicia? I'm doing all right, Mark. We were at the top of a glacier yesterday and we hiked out. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been one of the perks of living and working in Alberta is you get to go to the Rocky Mountains. And so it was a, a little trip to BC and we're close enough that you can go and come back and experience nature at all of its, with all of its splendor. So that's great. Oh, that is so, so cool. You know, I was, um, I'll, I'll just pull up a little video here. Actually, it might only just show the image. Just give me one second of what I saw when I was in Waterton just the other day. And I'm just going to pull it onto the screen. I'm not sure if it'll play as an actual video, but just let's see what happens here. Oh, just give me a second. Well, I thought it was going to work, but apparently it won't. Um, I have a better idea. This is a, a, a fun, fun... <laughs> A fun experiment sometimes when tech doesn't quite work the way you want it to. Let me just pull back here to this screen here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to show you this way. Okay, that's the YouTube channel. That's not the one I want. I want this one right here. I think it's quick down play. Yes. Okay, look at this little, look at this here. Isn't that the cutest little fawn you have ever seen? And you're so close, Mark. That's crazy. I zoomed in. It's my new iPhone. It's fantastic. It zooms in so far. Um, my other one, I stuck it under the water to take a video of a nice brook trout that I caught uh, swimming away. And apparently when I decided to get my screen fixed with non-Apple certified, um, <laughs> with a non-Apple certified screen, the waterproofing in the camera wasn't as good. So over the weekend, I had no access to my phone. So I ended up getting a new one. And this new phone is like, it's the bomb. So, so there we go. So yeah, beautiful little fawn, so cute and uh, in Waterton. So yes, the, the being out there is just, is awesome. So, so cool. So, all right, well, let's jump in and, and get to some of the notices. If you're tuning in for the first time or, or not, please post where you're listening from and we'll try to give you a shout out. Sharon is in NW, Calgary Northwest. And uh, let's see who else we've got here. Usman is uh, says, uh, keep on the good work. Thanks so much. We've got a LinkedIn user. So we've got people on LinkedIn and, and we love that. Um, and let's see who else we've got here. Uh, Krish is in California. Thanks for connecting in. Let's see what else we have here. Um, <laughs> Hamed says, dear Mark and Alicia, always impatient to watch your live. Well, that's great. And then we've got Henry is, a, is also a frequent watcher from Nigeria. Um, great to have you guys all here. Now, there's been a few things that have happened, Alicia, over the last little stretch. One has been our category-based draws. So if we slide over here and we take a look at our, our the government website here, we can see that just today, they did the second category-based round of invitations for healthcare. And when we look at the healthcare occupations here, um, we can see that the CRS score was 463. They invited 1,500 applicants. And um, yeah, it's, it's number three on the list of uh, category-based draws that they have done. So if we go back here, I think this probably pulled it up. We can see healthcare. And then last week they did a smaller healthcare. And you can see how it went. There's only 500 here, but it went from 476 down to 463 with this larger draw. So how far down it will go? I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, and it depends what category based draw they're going to do next, right? So they only did fi 500 STEM yesterday. Oh. So maybe they'll do more STEM in the next category based draw, or they might switch to one of the other, the French speaking maybe. So, you know, we've had three back to back draws in the last three days, which is unusual. We had one, you know, July 4th, July 5th, July 6th. So that's quite a few draws within a short period of time. So who knows, Mark, maybe it'll be two weeks before they do the next draw. Maybe maybe they'll do something differently now that they're doing the category-based draws. They haven't really settled into a pattern yet, so it's really hard to tell. It is very, very difficult to tell. 
And as, you know, as people are looking at this, maybe you can talk about what you feel the impact of these category based draws will have on these no program specified draws. Yeah, and it was interesting because we attended an uh, information session from IRCC when they were rolling this out and somebody asked that question, you know, is the fact that you're having category based draws now going, what is that going to do to the CRS for no program specified draws and immigration's view is that it might pull it down a little bit. But I don't know if that's right, Mark. Like, if you're going to have specific occupations, national occupation classification codes that are getting pulled under each of these categories, it means that everybody else has to have a higher CRS in order to have a chance at the no program specified, I think. Yeah. Well, it, it, the, only, the only way uh, that things are going to go is CRS scores for no program specified are going to increase. Because fewer people are, you know, are going to be extended invitations. And so the remaining people that are in the occupations that are not fitting within those categories are all going to be lumped in and there's going to be fewer spots to spread around. And remember, the levels plans are set. So it's not like they're adding more spots for the category based draws. They're pulling from the overall numbers that have been allocated each year. And we're this year around 80 some thousand spots. And like I talked about yesterday, you have to be careful and realize that, you know, for most people, it takes from the time an ITA is issued for most people, whether they're inside or outside Canada, realistically to get their application processed, it's going to be at least six months and for them to become a permanent resident. So as we hit July right now, the invitations that are being extended in most cases are going to be for people that will be completing their landings in, um, in 2024 where the, the, the rounds are, I think it's over 100,000 spots that they have available for uh, that, what they call the, the high skill categories express entry, through express entry. So, yeah, so we will, we will see how this all unfolds, um, but it's lots of fun. There's lots of things for us to speculate about. Yeah. And of course, Alicia, we have the, uh, the tech stuff, and I'm going to just pull, see if I can pull up the right, I've got a bunch of different links here that I was sharing with everybody. And there's one that I like the most, which is this one, which is kind of hidden a little bit. I'm going to slide over. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, this new tech talent strategy that immigration has, and they want the top talent from around the world. You have talent, we have opportunities. Does Canada really have opportunities, Alicia? What's your I response mean, Canada- to uh, to this fellow right here as he's extolling the virtues of Canada? La, 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 come to Canada. Look at me walking across the stage of the, of the collision conference. Uh, la, la, la. Okay, there we go. So immigration minister Fraser for sure wanted to pitch this as a big opportunity for people to come to Canada, especially in the tech sector. And I don't know if Canada has been ranking internationally for one of the source countries for tech sector, but it would like to. And so it's basically saying, look, we have opportunities, we have job opportunities. There were some massive layoffs in North America, specifically with um, some of the tech companies in the US. And I think they're trying to say, look, we have a home for you if you happen to be losing your job in the US and you happen to be on an H1BB's H-1B visa. So this is one of the things that they're going to be trying to target. And of course, that goes live on July 16th, which is a Sunday, everybody. So make note of that in your calendars. But there's also some other initiatives that they're trying to pitch in in terms of digital nomad strategy and in terms of startup visas and other things to try to attract tech talent. So they are trying to do that. I do think Canada has opportunities. Um, You know, we have lots of people who are looking for strong knowledge and skill sets for workers in these areas. And this is one way to bring them in without having to go through that LMIA process or without having to go through an intercompany transfer and be working for the qualified foreign organization for over a year. So it is a nice, fast way to bring people in. It is indeed. And one of the things I wanted to share with people, like lots of people are asking questions about this. And Minister, thank you so much for making an appearance. We'll have him disappear. Um, This is a multifaceted approach. And one of the things that they are highlighting is the existing things that Canada already has in place. And of course, they always start off with, you know, the pros and, and, you know, why Canada is a great place to come to. Let's face it, Alicia, if a tech worker, a software developer is, has a choice between working in Canada 
or working in the United States and money is the only thing that, that they're looking for, you're going to make more money as a, as a, you know, in tech in the U S than you are in Canada. I think that's pretty much without a given, you know, taxes are higher. There's other, you know, other things that are going to, to some extent impact on your wages, the dollar, those kinds of things. But this is, these are the things that Canada is, is really focusing on safety, security, stability, culture that celebrates diversity and, um, and services to help you get settled world-class education, you know, all these things that they focus on. And, uh, and that's really, I think what Canada has to offer. It's, for most of you, H-1Bs in particular, visa holders, you actually have a chance at becoming a permanent resident. And I've had lots of consultations this week through one of their programs, which Canada has announced, the Canada H-1B uh, visa holder open work permit. And as we scroll down here, you can see, I love this site because it has what I believe, I really think it's going to be here. Maybe it isn't, but at some point they're going to open up the the portal where you can click to get started and, and start your H-1B work permit application. Not yet, because it won't launch until July 16th. But you can see, if you want to immigrate, look, there's express entry. Processing times, they have six to 12 months here. And I think that's wise for them to put six because the people that are coming through this strategy are going to be applying from, well, the, the, in most cases, if they are going direct to Canada, it'll be a federal skilled worker program and processing times are higher. But in Canada, people who've got a year of experience that are applying from within Canada, we're seeing approvals in four months or even earlier or faster. So PR compared to the 25 years or whatever it is in, in the U.S. to get a green card if you're an Indian national, well, this is a huge thing. And if you look then at the startup visa, which is the other option, people who have innovative ideas and are looking to start up a business, Let's face it, the U.S. I think is going to give you more opportunities for, you know, for seed money and investment and things like that than maybe Canada would. But it's all of the other things that you get when you come to Canada. And so I think that's kind of the, you know, this is what they're pushing really hard. So that's on the immigrate. But then they say, hey, all you guys that have been laid off maybe recently or, or don't have a pathway or you're in a dead end option, you know, you just don't have options. You can come to Canada, and I like how they put immigrate here, but understand that means come to Canada temporarily, and it's H-1B visa holders. And you can see it goes live July 16th. Where is it going to be? Maybe right here. We'll know. We'll see. But processing the work permit, zero to two months. Why is it zero here? Well, it's zero because if you're the first to get it in, I personally think, Alicia, that it's going to be driven through the Kuwait portal or something similar to it. That's what I think. Because when does Quet officially come to an end? The Canada-Ukraine emergency authorization for travel? When is that? That's uh, It's like the 10th I or something? I think it's the 15th, but I'd have to double check. Well, is there is there a reason why they picked July 16th? <laughs> because Quet comes to an end on the 15th. So this is me thinking about this stuff. And so I think the way that you file for a Quet work permit, I think it's going to be very similar to the way you do this. Expedited... Yeah, that's what, that's what... Mm -hmm. That's what we talked about, Mark, because, yeah. you know, they have to have a method for being able to process a large number of applications quickly. And so right now, I mean, they have the GC key. Lots of people have their GC key account. There is also the, the temporary, you know, apply for a visa or work permit portal, which is a separate portal. But <clears throat> neither of those things are fast or program specific. So, yeah. And, and when they talk about this program, they talk about it being a uh, an expedited kind of uh, streamlined process. So when the, you don't need a job offer, well, all they care about is, are you an H-1B specialty occupation visa holder in the U.S.? And, you know, they know that the U.S. has already done all the heavy lifting for these applications. So all the background screening, they don't have to use the same degree of, of, uh, of investigation. That's the theory because the U.S. has already vetted people. And uh, when you come, it's a three-year open work permit, an open work permit. So I think they can really streamline it. And there isn't a lot of things that they're going to ask for. But in right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute, um, we have a wonderful group of people that have been piling in to attend our Canada H-1B work permit course. And there's a master class. The first one was um, was day before yesterday uh, in the evenings. They're always seven o'clock mountain time. That's nine Eastern. And you can do the math for the other zones, time zones. But it's designed to be here for me to answer any questions that you have as we're building up to when they actually release the details. Because we don't have the specific details 
but I've got a pretty good idea what they're going to be asking for. So people can connect in. There should be a link below to, to register for this and to become a part of it. And the part I love best about this, Alicia, is that everybody pools what they learn. And um, it's like this major crowdsourcing uh, tool that's used to share information. And people can go online and find all kinds of stuff. A lot of it's garbage. But how do you know whether it's garbage or whether it's worthwhile? Well, you come in and share it in the group. And then I have the opportunity to say, eh, I don't know if I trust that. And, uh, you know, but, but then other people will say, hey, I saw where they opened the program delivery instructions. And often people, when you have 11 consults a day, like I had on Monday, um, I'm not there screen, you know, screening um, the, the government website, refreshing it every five minutes, but some of my students are. And so everybody benefits collectively. And um, it's just, yeah, just I'm having so much fun with this. And I think truly people that are seeing dead ends in the U.S. with their H-1B status, this is a wonderful opportunity for them to consider Canada, North America, and all that Canada has to offer, including permanent resident status, which after three years, Alicia, if people lived in Canada, they can then consider applying for Canadian citizenship. So... Yeah. yeah. And just to follow up on that, like, it's good that you're making a demarcation between the permanent residence things that they're doing for tech occupations and the temporary residence. So remember, this is a work permit, right? This is not qualifying for permanent residence itself, yeah. unless you meet all the other requirements of minimum eligibility for express entry, just like you normally would have to. So keep in mind, this is a good long term strategy if you want to transition to PR, but you still will need to, you know, have this CRS points, have at least the education, have the language skills that you need to qualify, minimum eligibility for federal skilled worker, category-based draw, you know, CEC probably. Absolutely. All right, let's jump into some questions now, Alicia. Let's kick her into high gear for the balance of our live here. Okay, Lovey Dovey comes up and says, non-routine application, no procedural fairness letter, new ITA, what are the implication if withdrawing the EAPR and submitting a new application with a letter of explanation, work permit about to expire? So this is, this is one, um, I'm trying to make sense of this whole thing. Um, when you say it's a non-routine application, I'm not sure what that means. No procedural fairness letter received yet, I guess. New ITA. Okay, what are the implications if, of withdrawing the EAPR and submitting a new application with a letter of explanation? Um, I'm not quite sure we have enough. Alicia, can you make sense of this one here? I, I'm not sure if I we mean, have enough information you, to, to no, really explain I, this. I'm assuming that something is a little bit off in the application and they're worried about it and they're considering whether they you know, withdraw that application and just try to get a new one. But the complicating factor, of course, is the work permit's about to expire. And so, lovey-dovey, we can never mm -hmm. recommend a course of action or provide legal advice here. We're just trying to provide immigration legal information and share that. But if you do need specific immigration advice, please reach out and book a consultation and we'd be happy to talk to you to understand much more about what's going on in your situation. Yes. All right, here's over on LinkedIn. We'll shift over here. And this is a, this is a study permit question from Patricia. She says, if someone is in Canada as a visitor and wishes to get a study permit, okay, the country, it's a visa, so the country isn't an ETA country. I understand this is possible. This is where I love these creative, this sounds like an education agent strategy myself or, or uh, you know, uh, a creative immigration consultant. But I understand this is possible if the individual takes a prerequisite course like ESL. As long as this course lasts less than six months, can the person be exempt from having to leave Canada? So Alicia, any thoughts on this, this so, lovely strategy? I mean, in general, yes, you're allowed to take prerequisite courses, but normally those prerequisite courses have to be for a particular program of study. And the usual rule is that in order to apply for a study permit, one who has to do so from outside of Canada. And so just be very careful to make sure that if your goal is to try to set up for a study permit and a university or a college course, that you're going to be following normal immigration rules and regulations. There have been so many temporary public policies that it is almost impossible to keep things straight unless yeah. you go back to the program delivery instructions for everything all the time. 
Yes. All right. Let's jump to our next question. Ah, actually, this one isn't a question. It's a good thing. I am going to get ready with my applause button here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Karen says, remember I asked whether I should wait for a category-based draw or go with the OINP? Dentist plus French took a gamble by not applying and got an ITA today. So, and we know there's a bunch of you that have had that opportunity. We'll give Karen uh, a congratulations. And Karen, I recommend you slide over and subscribe to the Express Entry step-by-step course and join me in the masterclass. And I don't know if Igor has opened that up yet, but the it will be the end of the month here. So we are going to be doing our um, next Express Entry masterclass once this whole HB... Uh, oh, Igor is so fast. Good for him. Uh, once the H1B uh, frenzy is over, uh, we're going to do another masterclass. And remember, at any point in time that you that you register for the course, you have access to all future masterclasses. So the next one will be June 26th through the 29th of this. Oh, sorry. He hasn't updated it. It will be July. I thought he had updated it. It will be the end of the month, July. And let me just see. I can tell people who are wondering the exact date is it will be July 24th through the 27th. So the last full week in uh, in July, we're going to do another Express Entry Masterclass. The last one was awesome. But I'll tell you, Alicia, the folks that are in here, it is so much fun. So much fun. Everybody is almost virtually in the same situation. So sometimes Express Entry, you get people that are all different ba- walks of life and backgrounds. But oh my goodness, this right here, H-1B visa holders in the U.S., and they're all going through the same experiences. And in some case, people have already been laid off. And my, one thing I learned that I, you know, we don't practice U.S. immigration law, but they are cruel, Alicia. You get laid off. You Okay, let's say, give the example. You've spent, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a master's degree in the U.S. Then you get your first H-1B. This fantastic job with a tech company. They're paying you $200,000 U.S. a year. And then they lay you off. They say, well, sorry, we don't have a job for you anymore. We, we were, I guess apparently we've been paying people too much. And then guess what happens, Alicia? 60 days to find another job. 60 days. And if they don't, it's happy trails. Off you go back to, to India or wherever you came from. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been seeing is people are really worried about disclosing what happens during those 60 days if they fall out of status or if they have remained past those 60 days before transitioning to another employer. And everybody's got to be really, really careful about misrep here because these work permit applications always ask for your history, right? Your address history, your work history, where you were, where you were and what you were doing. And so be very careful not to misrepresent. Um, in general. And there's going to be a whole bunch of, you know, variations and permutations in terms of what happened for each individual applicant. But in general, be very careful about not misrepresenting. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Flying to Canada says, hey, Mark and Alicia, hope you're doing well. I know that you are too busy with so much dynamics happening around. Oh my goodness. That's an understatement. That is an absolute understatement. Okay. Let's see. I think we had another... Let's just see here. Give me one second. Okay. Khan says, Mark, I'm a permanent resident and want to invite my father. Now the issue is that his name in my passport is spelled differently than his passport remedy. And what's the remedy for this? So clearly Khan is probably from India. I've never seen so many misspelled names and variations and things. But Alicia, how does someone deal with that when it doesn't line up perfect? Yeah, and we run into this issue often. Um, Usually it's a matter of proving your identity and there's a number of ways to do it and it's going to depend upon what documentation you have. But usually, Con, you're going to look at your birth certificate. You're going to look at your siblings' birth certificates. You're going to look at your parents' marriage certificate. You're going to look at your passport, your siblings' passports, because those are going to say who your parents are. And then you're going to look at your parents' passports as well plus your parents' birth certificates. And you're going to line all this up. Maybe you also have Adar cards or you've got something else to show identity and you're going to have relevant parties do an affidavit and say, look at 
I am the father. Uh, these are my kids. Here is my wife. These are all my biological children. I am swearing an affidavit. You're going to have that um, notarized, taken to a notary, and you're going to have attachments as exhibits showing all the relevant documents. If there are spelling errors, that affidavit is going to talk about where the spelling errors are and acknowledge that you are indeed their biological child. Um, I'm assuming that you're looking at doing a, a super visa or trying to bring your parent over to come visit. So, Excellent. All right. RV says, hey, I called your office. I'm not able to find the page on the IRCC where H1B will get um, uh, the sh get started button will go live. You showed the page in your last video. So this is a perfect example of me trying to share as much. Yes, we have a course and yes, people pay to come in. And yes, they, 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 to get the real Intel, like deep down, um, it, it's released through a series of on-demand courses and master classes, but we are not hoarders of information. And so I don't know RV, if this is exactly where it's going to be, I am entirely speculating and, uh, yes, it's not easy to find this page. And so people are asking, where is this? Where is this? Well, for all of you fine folks, the, the link, um, I just posted it in, let's see if I can find it right here. So I posted the link in the, in the YouTube video. And so you can, um, in the, in the live chat, so you can, that's, that's it. You guys can type it in manually or otherwise, but, uh, but there you go. <laughs> he said, awesome. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm glad that you were able to resolve that. <laughs> yes. Prem told me you called and I'm like, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what he's talking about. It hasn't been released yet, but now I understand what you were looking for. So it makes sense. Okay. Uh, okay. Shirley says, um, and let's maybe, I have an idea here. Just give me one second. I'm going to flip back here. We got a little bit more room and then we'll pull this up. So Shirley says, would they still draw for this week? Total draw so far is just 2,700. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing no. I'm guessing we're probably done for this week. If they had 700 on Tuesday, the July 4th, in a no program specified, then they had 500 STEM yesterday, and then they had 1,500 today. I'm guessing they're probably going to take a break, and it won't be till next week that they do another draw. But I don't know, Mark. What do you think? Yeah, I well, you can look at the total numbers. So you know, for May 10th, they did a PNP of 589, and it wasn't until two weeks later that they did another big one. So the fact that they've done, it's possible they could maybe next week, maybe do another one and get back in line with that. Um, but yeah, if you look here over that course from the 27th, remember to the, the sixth here, this right here, you guys is roughly within a one week span. So, um, you know, if they're doing every two weeks, kind of like they did before, although we had a little bit of a gap through here, um, you know, the 4,000, 4, you know, 4,000, 4, 5,000, at a period where they only did 3,500 here. So uh -huh. it's, it's, yeah, obviously we're speculating. Maybe there are other categories, right? And if we go to our, our website here and we go to blog posts and we check out an awesome blog that Alicia did on category-based draws right here, you guys will be able to see that so far they've only targeted two out of the, the larger group. So it's still entirely possible that we could have just a French one or uh -huh. trade or transport or ag. So maybe they're doing little dribs and drabs and maybe we'll see a 500 one of these pop in. We'll just have to see how it plays out. All right. Okay, let's see what's next. Uh, I think, oh, we got someone back. Lovey Dovey's back. What are the implications of withdrawing a CEC EAPR under review for nine months and submitting a new application by correcting the error show it on GCMS evaluate? Okay, so that's, I think that's really the question. So. Uh, what are the implications if you notice that your EAPR has got issues and then you request to withdraw? And we kind of talked about this already, but, um, you know, obviously yeah. it depends on what the problem was, you know, was there an actual mm -hmm. fraudulent document you put in there? Because is there misrep? More, yeah. Is there misrep? Once you click submit, you're attesting at that stage that everything is true, complete and correct. And you're making it a part of your immigration record. So uh, Alicia, as far as consequences, yeah. So, and there's some interesting case law or arguments in terms of whether you can withdraw an application or whether they can still find you inadmissible for misrep, even if you've tried to ask to withdraw it. Um, so that's an evolving area. But in general, if you have submitted information that's misrepresentation, 
generally immigration can hold you to that because that was part of your application even if you later go and try to withdraw it now you might have a legal argument it depends on what kind of application documentation you submitted um, we don't know we have no idea right it was it fraudulent was it misrep if there's something else that some I don't know if it's nine months in process it sounds like there's something that they're they're digging into or maybe you're doing a federal skilled worker outland application the risk of course of withdrawing is that they could still hold that against you that's the risk yeah. the other risk of withdrawing is that then you go back to the very beginning so if your work permit i think you'd said on the other um, super chat your work permits imminently expiring you might be running out of options so you might be in the situation where you'd have to go back to your home country and continue to process your application and i don't know if that would affect your crs or not depending on you know um, how many points you claim for foreign skilled work versus canadian skilled work and how close you were on each so the risk as you go back out you don't have any guarantee of getting a new ita and they might still hold whatever it was on this application that's a problem they might still try to hold that against you yes all right uh... Eunice says, six months has passed, not a single update on my account from AOR, not having any response till now. Let's imagine that IRCC doesn't want me as an applicant. FSW Outland. All right, this is where I need to really try to manage everybody's expectations. So let's slide over here. Uh, and Alicia, uh, you, you, can, you can give the answer, but I'll just pull it up. Yeah, so keep in mind that there is still a big divide. There is still a large difference in processing times between a inside Canada CEC application versus the outside this Canada. Dropped. Right? It this dropped. It did drop. It was 24. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just today, so, guys, hot off the press. We have great news for all of you FSW individuals. Processing times have dropped down to seven months. Breaking news. Just a second. Just a second. This is this is awesome. Okay, here we go. Breaking. <laughs> All right. Breaking news. Like I said, this is actually pretty crazy to have it back down to almost their, you know, legislated um, service level agreements. That's pretty impressive. So, so buddy, um, you're not far out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they're, if they're on average seven months, then hopefully, I mean, they were on average 24 months up until yeah. today. So yes. we'll, I'm not it sure where changed. you are in that pool. Yeah. It just changed. I love that little breaking news. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Here, let's shift gears to something that we don't get a lot of questions on criminality. So lucky luck. Well, Hopefully the question about criminality isn't related to you because you wouldn't be very lucky. But can criminality be checked if biometric isn't done yet for an FSW applicant? Just received my GCMS notes. I see criminality in progress. Biometric not started. Eligibility marked calculate. No MEP. So the simple question is, can criminality be checked if biometric isn't done yet? And yeah. the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. So yes, I mean, Canada is part of the five eyes, right? They share information with the US and um, the UK and they share it with New Zealand and Australia. And so there is a large information sharing network between the FBI and Canadian law enforcement and CBSA. So they will check a number of sources internally, just routinely whenever anybody's trying to do a PR application. Um, they will also double check that against your biometrics once you go and you give your fingerprints and they will run that as a more specific check but especially if you've had military service or you work for a government organization those are all things that they can start doing their background checks on criminality whatever they would like to do at whatever point it makes sense for them to do it all right let's jump over to our h1b so for the h1b category sumit says if me and my spouse both have H-1B work permits. Do we have to file one application or will we have to file basically separate applications for us? And this is an interesting question. It really is. Um, you know, do you, do you race to file too? Or, or what do you do? Um, what are your thoughts on this, Alicia? 
Well, I mean, they've said there's 10,000 spots, not including spouses and kids. So they have said that somebody's a principal applicant and they'll count that as one. And then they, that person can bring their family. Um, strategically, I mean, if, if one is a stronger applicant for some reason, or one of you between you and your spouse have your documents in order and ready to go, or an easier work history or anything like that, maybe it makes sense for one of you to choose to file that application. I don't know if it's worth it for both of you to choose to file that application if it's a race, right? If it's a race and you're trying to figure out who's going to get in the fastest, um, I would say put your eggs in one back basket and then have the second spouse as the backup if there happens to be more time. But I would prioritize one of them that had the stronger application. A quick question here from Moses. He says, what are your consult fees? If you guys go to our site, you can easily see. Just click on speak to a lawyer and all of our fees are set out here for 25 minute consult. We charge 300 plus 5% tax, which is 315 Canadian. And, uh, and you can just click on and speak to a lawyer and there you have it. Okay, jump back here and we will get to um, Mankush. I'll have you answer this, Alicia. He says, hey, Mark, 520 CRS regular draw. What do you think? What do you think, Alicia? I think you're good. <laughs> 520 CRS, if you've calculated that properly, you should be golden um, because very, very rarely does it go all the way up to 520 as a cutoff. Yeah. So no program specified was 511. Maybe a whole bunch of people piled in within the last couple of days, but probably a 520 you're going to get an ITA as long as everything checks out in how you've calculated your points. You bet. And we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay, uh, Vikrant says, hi, Mark, when can we expect the required documents that were, are needed for H1B stream? This is a great question. Maybe I can tackle this one. So let's look historically. And you guys know that I've spent a little bit of time talking about the TR to PR pathway because there are unbelievable amounts of similarities between these two programs. And if we slide over here to the old expired, okay, watch this. It should, oh, it doesn't pop up. I guess it must remember my browser. This closed November 5th, 2021. But just like the, the H-1B program, they say it's open for a year or until we hit 10,000. Well, within the program here, oh, there it is. Yes, it's expired. Um, when you look at the actual general streams here, you can see that for the recent international graduates, it was unbelievably popular, this category. And they had 40,000 spots. And, um, and so during that time period, um, people were just, the moment they announced it, were looking everywhere to get instructions and guidance. Well, for whatever reason, and I, I'll pull him up, but it wasn't his fault. Minister Fraser, it was Minister Mendicino at the time. But for whatever brilliant uh, purpose, and I will kind of be a little critical of IRCC, they didn't release the actual program delivery instructions until the day before the program launched. Now, with that being said, I was the national chair at the time, and I've learned a few things about the way the department operates. And so we did another, uh, we did another course just like this one for TR to Peer Pathway. And we workshopped everybody through. We did master classes, and we started preparing people in advance. So when that day came, I think it was maybe it was May 5th, maybe, or May 6th, I can't remember, of 2021. Mm -hmm. I think it was May 5th, maybe. Um, when they, when they opened it up on May 4th and actually showed, uh, you know, what was required, we already had a very good idea of what was going to happen. So the clients had forms ready. They had, um, they had their, uh, their documents ready. And then when I attended a few technical briefings with IRCC, I was then able to share that basically with the YouTube channel and, and within the members of, of, of the, uh, the TR to PR pathway course. And so in this process, when they ask, you know, when do we think that these documents and the list of what actually is going to happen, including where it's going to be submitted, when that's actually launched, um, you know, we just don't know. But I will be very, very critical now of Minister Fraser. And I don't, I personally, I think if they don't provide instructions or reasons, at least on the Monday before that Sunday, I think they're not being very kind. Now, I want to explain something to you guys as well. Sometimes there is a reason why they wait to the last minute. People are savvy. People are smart. There's lots of you high-tech software developers, use of AI, the, the use of auto-populating software um, that can sometimes get in and kind of hack the process. 
and, um, and disrupt. And so when the government does these quick to file things, very, very rarely do they open things up more than a couple days before the actual filing because they don't want to give enough time for smart little AI software and things like that for people to integrate with the system. And then you've seen what happens when you're trying to get tickets to your favorite concert through Ticketmaster or something. Some software programs are designed to just like, you know, robot technology to, to rapid, you know, to rapid submit information. And, and I think it's a little bit precarious. I would love to see that the minister open this, opens this up, you know, at least a week before, or at least the Monday before. So people have the week to prepare, but it's entirely possible. They could wait till the very day before. So what are we doing in the course? We spend our time talking about the possibilities and so that people are collecting way more documents than they actually need. They are getting all of their forms, at least what we would expect. Probably they're going to ask ready. So in the event it actually goes live, no matter what it looks like, if we don't even know what it looks like until it goes live, the, the clients in the course are actually going to be prepared. So they're ready with their laptops and their Canadian flag behind them and the American one beside them. And, and they go through and, and no matter what this fine minister does here in terms of his, uh, his, his, you know, how they're going to launch the, the H1B um, category, this, this one right here, no matter what they do, maybe the spots right here, maybe you click right here and it will take, there'll be a get started button right here. We just don't know. But one thing's for certain, we meet regularly within the group and we share Intel and I talk about everything that I know, including where, based on whatever, 20 years of experience and putting my head together with all the other people in the firm, um, where we think it might be and how to prepare. So I know that was a very long answer, but this is this is crazy, Minister. You guys are doing it again. And they why do you think they're doing it on Sunday, Alicia? Well, maybe it's because people are working in the U.S. and they need a day to be able to prepare and submit these documents. But that also means that you and I are working on a Sunday, Mark. So that's, the, that's yeah. the downside. And in reality, we're probably working on Saturday too. And I would advise anyone who is considering going through the H-1B, the Canada H-1B open work permit, that you also block off the Saturday before. So if you can avoid it, don't work Saturday or Sunday, the November, um, July the, uh, the 15th and the 16th, um, because we know that that's when they're going to launch it. And I tried to see Alicia as well, if there was any way that, um, excuse me, maybe they might do it more like a lottery where they open it up for a month and then, but that's not what they've said. They've said it's open for a year and the first, once they reach 10,000, which is code for, we're going to open it on July 16th and it's going to be a frenzy and we just want this to be done. We'll assign all these quet officers who are processing, processing quet visas to do this. And that's what I believe. And, uh, and they'll, you know, and they'll process these because they're already used to working within these portals. So that's my, that's my educated guess, educated guess, but great question. Really, really good question. Okay. Well, they, they keep coming. Jay says, what's going to happen after three years? And you alluded to this a little bit, Alicia, is this ex extendable work permit? And um, do you know yeah. what, Alicia, you and I, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to do, um, we're going to do a video um, on the options. If you get your open three, three year postgrad, cause I uh, sorry, your, your, your three year um, H1B, you know, Canada open. open work permit. We're going to do a video, I think on this. I think this is what people are wondering. If I do this, well, what options do I have? Cause people just don't know. Mm -hmm. At this point, Jay, it's not an extendable work permit. It's just a one and done, right? If you happen to qualify and you happen to be within those lucky first 10,000 applicants, then great for you. You've got three years of open work permit if your passport and your family's passports are valid for that length of time. So it might be less depending on your passport validity. But within those three years, hopefully you are hustling your bustle to make sure that you have got everything that you need to qualify for CEC under maybe a category-based draw. Maybe those category-based draws will change in terms of the occupations next year, but you're doing everything you can to maximize your points. So what I recommend, learn French, right? If you don't already know French, try to learn French. That's probably going to be a safe thing to do, but otherwise stay tuned and Mark and I'll do a video. Yeah. And I think actually, Alicia, in the course um, tomorrow, tonight in our masterclass, I think that's what I'm going to talk about right off the bat. If you get it, what options do you have and how does it differ from the United States? And I'll be honest, you guys, there are way more opportunities to transition to permanent residence in Canada than there ever will be in the United States. If you are, you know, in 
this limbo, especially if you come from a country, and I'll qualify it because there's always pathways forward depending upon the countries you come from. But I understand anywhere from 60 to 70% of H-1B you know, holders in the U.S. Um, are from India, or at least that, that region. And they tell me 25 to 30 years to get their permanent residence. It's just, you're going to be dead before that happens. So you're basically in the U.S., in limbo, on temporary status, beholden to your employer with no long-term security. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. All right, Henry says, will the H-1B, um, uh, will it affect the STEM category-based draws? What do you think, Alicia? Well, I mean, this. keep in mind, this is the difference between permanent residence and temporary residence, right? So they have said the target <clears throat> for certain types of occupations overall, um, they lay those out in permanent residence but they don't have specific targets for work permits, like what kind of occupation people have to be in for work permits right now. So this is a new thing that they're kind of trying or experimenting with for one of the first times. So hopefully, the, you know, the fact that you have H-1B work permits is not going to at all negatively affect the STEM category-based draws. It will act as a feeder, right? That having those temporary work permits valid for three years will hopefully set people up for being able to be eligible for future category-based draws, we know that those category-based draws will be reset based on the feedback that the government gets for 2023. But based on the labor market outlook, they have said, we don't think these types of occupations are going to go away anytime soon. And, you know, take a look at the video that Mark and I did um, last week. But one of the sources to look at is the Canadian Occupational Projection System. So COPS is what they call it. And that's where they have data on their long range, medium range, kind of what they see as chronic shortages in our labor market. And ours, let's see which one. I'm, we've got so many videos. I can't even remember which one we did. It's, uh, I think we did three last week. There. Yeah, it was, it was a live. Um, I don't, I don't remember. Maybe new target of draws. Uh, maybe it was this one. I don't know. Whatever. You, <laughs> there's so many. I can't keep track of. Uh, we're just pumping out so much. There's like so much going on. Um, okay. If tech asks a question that I know he's asking one thing, but it's cued something else that's really important. Another tip, and we're constantly sharing this stuff, you guys. Swiftex says for the master class, and he's referring to the to the actual course, this one right here. He says for this for this course here, um, he says, um, can I make payments in two transactions as the banking institution does not uh, allow purchases over three hundred USD? Okay, this is great for us, and yes, absolutely. If tech, if you reach out to us, just send an email to info at healthylaw.com, and we can sort it out. That's not a problem. But my concern for you, my friend, is if you have family and you're applying through the program and, um, and there's you know, more than you and your spouse and an accompanying family member, your credit card has to be able to do a transaction um, that is enough to cover, well, it's $255 per work permit. So if instantly, if, there's, if you have a dependent with you, um, your credit card probably won't be able to handle two, two people to pay the receipt for the, for the processing fees. So that's my concern, if tech. Um, that's that's what it is. But yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we are more than happy to accommodate. And uh, all you need to do, like I said, is just send an email to info at healthylaw.com. I don't know if I even have, uh, I'll probably have to do a new one right here. Let's see, info at healthylaw.com. Yeah, you can just send an email right here. Oh, you can't even see it. Oh, you can see it right there. We'll stick it on top of there. So yeah, just info at healthylaw.com. And if you're having trouble with the payment, because I don't want anyone not to be able to benefit from the course, um, if just because the, the payment isn't working for them. There's lots of ways we can sort that out. So yeah, just send it right there. Okay, let's jump to some other good stuff here. Give me a second. Okay. Um, okay, here's one. Mankush, um, Oh, I think, did we cover this one? Maybe this is somebody else. I just submitted on 520 regular draw. What do you feel? Did we, did we answer this one? I think we had more than one I person. I think it was somebody that else. That's a good question. I was, I was thinking yeah. if it was maybe duplicated. So yeah. So I think, what, what's your response, Alicia? Is, is, uh, 520 should be good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, while we're on that topic, Syed says, I'm stuck at 470. Will improving my IELTS and, you know, with improving IELTS, you can reach up to 475, maybe 480. 
Will there be any chance in the future to get an IT under normal express entry draw at this level? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the higher you can get that CRS, the better, but um, it's, it's tricky to say right now because it's been bouncing around, you know, consistently around 486 on those no program specified. That's kind of been where it's uh, settled. However, this week on the no program specified, it was 511, which is really high, right? We haven't seen those really high figures since right after the pandemic. So it's tricky. Anything you can do to make sure that you're legitimately getting your points up. And most of that, most of the time people lose points on language. Right? It's the only thing that you can really do anything about. You can't do anything about your age. You can usually try to rewrite your language to get maximize your English and hopefully get some French. All right. Uh, JK, I'll just touch on it just quickly. He says, hey, it's been 90 days after AOR. What about me? Is there a problem? Um, you know, uh, the processing times are what they are. Express Entry PNP in particular, you know, there's all kinds of, like they're all over the map. And they're definitely coming down. But yeah, 90 plus days is it's well within the processing times. Well within it. Okay, Sean says, if an inland express entry is approved while temporarily traveling outside, can the applicant enter Canada again? Sean, this is one where there's lots of permutations and um, wrinkles that we would need to discuss in terms of, yeah, what's the risk to you, right? So... This is going to depend on your passport validity. It's going to depend on whether there's anything that immigration or CBSA officials might say that you could have worked without authorization or studied without authorization or misrep something or turn you away at the border. Um, Just be careful about traveling. It's much safer if you did an inside Canada CEC application to stay inside of Canada, get your PR. And then once you have your PR card, then you can do your traveling. All right, another follow-up from MIFTEC here. He says, my proof of funds has been kept in a joint account with my spouse who will accompany me. A large transfer will be made as my uh, provided fund gets transferred this month. Is this gradual accumulation an issue? Yeah, so uh, if you've got a joint account and I'm assuming that you're doing an express entry application um, and your spouse is accompanying, then you do want to show the source of those funds. And so make sure that you're getting exactly what they say in the completeness check in terms of the proof of funds letter from the bank showing your average balance for the last six months plus your detailed statements. You will want to show where that money is coming from. So if there is some sort of large transfer, if that's a gift and that's being given by a family member, you'll want to have a gift deed to accompany it. If it's just like some sort of um, bonus from your spouse's employer or some sort of pension document, you know, you'll still want to explain that. So make sure that you have a, an accompanying letter of explanation. And if you need to have a gift deed, if that money is from a family member, make sure that you get a notarized gift deed. All right, next question. This one is from Krish. Is I'm working in the US for the last five years on H1B. My H1B visa expired in May, 2023, and the new H1B extension has been filed, result awaiting. Uh, Will I be eligible for Canada's new H1B work permit program? And obviously, Alicia and I, until we know the exact program delivery instructions, uh, Krish, we can't say 100% yes. But in my mind, the focus that the minister has on, on candidates, I have to assume that they are much more interested in people who do not have a very immediate pathway forward, whose H-1Bs are expiring. And in fact, in some of the, um, uh, some of the you know, notices that uh, IRCC has pushed out, background information, they have alluded to the fact that you know, if your status in the U.S. is expiring soon, consider this program. And I would have to assume that there is a pathway, Krish, um, but it just it just depends because ultimately you've got, you know, it does say a visa holder, an H-1B visa holder. And if yours is truly expired, we'll have to see what, uh, you know, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll just have to see what the minister does. All right. Um, okay. Ajay says, hello, Mark. Can the postgrad work permit holder whose work permit is expiring apply for a French mobilité program? CLB5, TEF, job offer without LMIA. So what do you think? Can, can people transition from a postgrad to a TEF in Canada? Inside Canada depends, but yes, in general, you can go to a mobilité francophone if you have a an employer. Um, so this is the problem here. If you 
have, okay, they do have a job offer, but without an LMIA. So yes, if you're looking at the IMP, so French Mobility, um, Mobilité Francophone, is an IMP program. So this is one where you have to have an employer, you have to have a job offer, and they go through the employer portal to file that offer of employment. So it doesn't have an LMIA, that's just how the program works. But you do have to prove that you're meeting those French language eligibility parameters. So one of the things with Mobilité Francophone is that you normally have to prove that French is your everyday language, your, your language of common usage. So just be careful with that. But yes, in general, there are ways that you can apply to try to transition for this Mobilité Francophone. Take a look at the program delivery instructions because they usually like to see people apply as a fresh application from outside Canada for the Mobilité Francophone. But in some circumstances, you might be able to make it work depending on whether you're a visa required holder or not. All right, we're quickly running out of time. Let's pull a Facebooker up here. Ulu says, if I apply in CEC, four months processing, if I request a bridging open work permit, will my PR application processing be affected in any way? What if my EAPR is processed before the bridging open work permit or will both be processed together? This is a good question, actually. Mm -hmm. So, it, no, it's not going to negatively affect your permanent residence application as long as there's nothing contradictory in your bridging open work permit, right? If you put something that's totally from left field and you're bridging open work permit for your work history or your education or your studies or something like that that conflicts and is a material misrepresentation compared to your CEC EAPR, that would be a problem. But if everything is absolutely perfect, you've gone through it with a fine tooth comb and you know that it is correct and complete and it meshes with what you had in your CEC application, then the fact that you're filing that bridging open work permit should not negatively affect you unless, and Mark and I, you and I have talked about this, there might be circumstances where you have tried to claim arranged employment points in your CEC. And if you try to go to a bridging open work permit, you might be at risk of losing your arranged employment points. So that is one big caveat, and this is super mm -hmm. technical. So if this is your situation, please reach out and book a consult. Um, yep. If in your, you didn't claim arranged employment points and you don't have to worry about that and you're just looking at, you know, you're worried about your work permit expiring, then if your EAPR is processed and you get your PR, well, good for you. You don't need to worry about work permits anymore, right? So they're not necessarily processed together. So you can apply. And if you happen to get PR first, then that's great news and you don't need to worry about that bridging open work permit. All right. Um, uh, we'll just do a couple little shout outs. Oh, Hassan says, can you guys talk us through the process and timeline after receiving an ITA? Okay. I just want to reiterate to everybody. Yes. Right now we're pushing hard this H1B uh, work permit course and the, and the cart is open here, but I strongly encourage you to subscribe to the express entry course. This course allows, it's a detailed walkthrough of every aspect of the express entry process. Um, you know, in, in terms of invitations to apply, um, you'll see that there's a whole series of videos and lessons for the EAPR portion. If you're talking about express entry, okay? So I strongly encourage you to, to, to jump in and then this will be July, the end of July, the last week in July, the last full week, we'll be doing another masterclass and you can come and get all of your questions answered related to your express entry file. If you're asking about, you know, timelines after receiving an ITA in the context of the H-1B visa, well, this isn't going to be like an express entry process. It's literally going to be an application, a complete application that you're going to submit and you need to get it right the first time because there isn't going to be multiple opportunities because if you don't get it right the first time, then what's going to happen is there's going to be another person more than willing to, to kind of fill in and take your spot. And uh, so, yeah, just give you a, a little bit of heads up about that. Um, let's see, Ravin, uh, Ravi says, hey, Mark, love your videos. Highly appreciate your efforts to help out people love from India. That gets you an applause. Um, Joyful says, do I have to let IRCC know if I get a fiance after I submit my EAPR? I'll let you yeah, tackle that one, so Alicia. Yeah, so there's actually um, a completeness check, A11.2. And we used to bring this up more, Mark. We haven't brought it up for a little while. Yeah. But um, maybe Mark can put it into the show notes or the link. But keep in mind that there are differences in terms of when you get married or when you are considered to be a common law spouse. So 
be careful that with, you know, fiance is not a legal spouse, according to Canadian immigration law, there's either a legal marriage, or there is a common law partner, meaning that you have cohabitated continuously for 12 months in a conjugal relationship. So if you don't fall into one of those categories, you can't have a spouse, you don't have a legal spouse, but in some circumstances, um, you'll have to do an analysis to see whether you do fit the, the category of a common law spouse. And I just had a consult recently on that very point, because you don't want to be in a situation where you misrep or you fail to disclose a spouse if you are in actually a de facto common law situation. Anatoly says, hey, Mark and Alicia, thank you for your live streams. These help me to realize how careful I should be when filing my EAPR. That's exactly right, Anatoly. And then we'll wrap it up here with Spider-Man. He says, hi, Alicia, since we are all going to be stuck in the limbo between postgrads and ITAs, could you do a blog post with regard to closed work permits? Many, many thanks as always. Yeah, and Spider-Man, I did do a blog post um, a while ago, and, and almost all of it should still apply. There's a few other kind of potentials now that we have some of these tech streams and category-based draws. But when people were running out of status in Canada and they were trying to figure out what to do when their PGWPs were expiring, I did do a big, long blog post. It's got a nice view of the mountains on it, um, and it goes through what are your what are your options. What are you potentially going to be able to do if you've got your postgrad work permit expiring and you're looking to transition to a closed work permit? Is there an option for an LMIA? Is there an IMP option for you under Francophone Mobilité or um, an IEC, International Experience Canada? Or is there some other work permit that you could do to try to get some more points and get some more Canadian education or experience while you're here before you hopefully get that ITA. So take a look at that blog article that I had written a while ago. And but it's a good idea. I can I wrote it down, you know, what what are the ways to try to look at getting a closed work permit now. So this it's is this one, this isn't is, it? Yeah, this is it from before. Um, these are all going to be still applicable with the addition now of some of the tech occupations and some of the category based draws. So the former options are still there too. Okay, I'm just going to drop this link into the chat here. And, uh, and then I will slide over here and I will pull it up. There it is. So those of you who want to freeze frame later and there's the link to the blog post, but there's a ton of information in addition to what we've shared today. We talk about it all the time, but it, it, it's important that I keep reiterating because there's so much information. We won't be able to get to all of your questions. We never can. But when it comes to the process that we, you know, that we follow and, and just reaching out and trying to assist and help people, yes, we want you to come to our website. If you have a specific legal matter that you need us to, you know, you need help with, if you just want the peace of mind of hiring us to help you uh, prepare and submit your application, that is what we do. And we do this so that you can say, hey, you can see, well, these jokers, looks like they know what they're doing. And Alicia and I have been at this game for 20 years more. And, and um, we've learned a few things about immigration as Canadian immigration lawyers. And we're here to help you and support you. So it all starts with a consultation. So just click on that speak to a lawyer and it'll take you right here where you can literally schedule a consultation right away. And I think Alicia's card is so, uh, so Thursday's filled up, but Monday's open. And uh, I'm trying to think what my capacity is. I'm assuming I'm probably full too. Uh, yep, same. So, <laughs> so you can book a consult for Monday. You can get right in and um, yeah, and we'd love for you to do that. But in addition to this, up here, we have blog and resources. And we have our, of course, the immigration DIY courses. Those are available. I've got so many things going on here. Um, we've got our blog post. We've got our Canadian Immigration Podcast here. Um, this is displaying a little bit funny. Our newsletter you can subscribe to. And then, of course, the DIY courses. So there's lots of other information in addition to just going on to our YouTube channel and searching. And I want to share one last little thing as we go to my channel here. And as we look, we are so close. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do it. We're at 49.9 thousand subscribers and I'd love to roll over 50. And as a, I would love nothing more than to do my 800th video um, to celebrate 50,000 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, head on over here. 
And I just wanted to answer one last question because I saw yeah. it there from Monsoon Winter and it's okay. with respect to if you have a disability. And yes, there are still ways to be able to qualify under express entry if you have a disability and you're not able or your family member is not able to do the language test in the regular way. So if you go to the language test and IRCC, then you know if you're not able to complete one or more of the sections because of a disability, then there is a way to use the CRS language calculator to find out your score on the ones you were able to complete and then the one that you're not able to complete. It's going to input the average scores based on what you completed. So um, take a look at that. Just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you're not eligible in general. Yes. And I can tell you from personal experience that I had a client that did have a learning disability. And if we just slide over here, it was in the early days of express entry to the point where even the officers didn't know that it existed, the ability to average your scores. And so in his case, all that he had was the speaking. And, um, and, and so when it comes to, um, and I'll just, I will pull up your, the rest of it here for a second monsoon, but, but this, so just hang tight. Um, this here is an ability to, you know, use this calculator and you can actually out average the scores and it gives you instructions on how to do this. Um, but yeah, we were successful at first. They rejected it because they said, oh, your language test isn't complete because it only has one ability on it. But, um, we, you know, we had all the reports, the, the, uh, um, the, you know, psychologist reports, everything to show that the learning disability was there. And he's been a permanent resident since probably 2015, 2016. So yes, that's a great, uh, great point. And then let's pull up the rest and we'll, we'll tackle the rest for you here. So my sister is deaf. I know she can come on the study permit, get a work permit, but not sure if she can apply for PR. So I've been said you need an English exam to apply for PR. Kindly suggest thanks. I think we've hit it. I think we've answered that. Okay. All right. Okay, well, we're going to wrap it up, you guys. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. As always, this has been quite, uh, yeah, this has been quite fun. We have had a, uh, a, a very dynamic live stream today, and you guys have had a lot of really good questions. As always, I want to thank um, Journey Business Plans for being our sponsor. They sponsor our podcast, and they've been a really good sponsor of us uh, for many, many years. And I'm going to pull up um, in a lot of different forms and, and uh let me just pull up their, their page here and I'll share it with everybody. So if you're looking to immigrate and you're going through one of the, um, the programs that would require a business plan, I strongly encourage that you connect with them because they do great work. And whether you're an immigration a applicant yourself or an immigration consultant or lawyer, they've got a lot of, lot of tools and resources and this is what they do. And let's face it, <clears throat> we're not all professional business plan producers. So <clears throat> if you've got a company that's doing an intercompany transfer, if you're looking at a startup visa, you're looking at, you know, coming as self-employed, uh, permanent, permanent resident streams, um, Journey Business Plans can help guide you through the process of putting together a really solid business plan um, that, can, uh, that can significantly help and strengthen your application. So big shout out to them. Thanks so much. All right, Alicia, I guess we've got more consults and more work. And I've got a podcast episode I'm going to be recording. That reminds me, guys, go subscribe to the podcast as well. There'll be lots more dropping. And in fact, uh, before we jump off, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that Igor just, I saw a notification. I think he just released or dropped our last podcast. There it is. So all you tech guys that are coming, uh, leaving work here in a couple hours and want to learn more about it, subscribe to the podcast and listen to Alicia and my episode, the tech talent strategy and, and work permit for H1B holders. Um, you can, you can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and go check it out and you can listen while you drive. All right, there we go. Thanks Alicia. Okay. Take care everybody.